In this video, I will help you earn extra test points on pericarditis. This is a very, very high yield topic, shows up quite often, allows test writers to ask you multiple different questions because as you'll see in just a moment here, pericarditis connects with pathology, microbiology, biochemistry, uh, physiology. There's so many different aspects. They can go at this from so many different directions and that's why this shows up on exams almost every single exam. So let's, let's just do a brief overview to establish what is pericarditis and what are we talking about today. So pericarditis refers to inflammation of the pericardium. Recall that the pericardium is a fibrocerous sac that surrounds the heart. And it has multiple functions, both of which are protective functions and also cardiogenic functions inherently. When we look at the pericardium, it really has two different layers. It has the parietal layer, which is rich in nerves, and it has the visceral layer right on top of the epicardium. Now, just a little aside here about terminology. When somebody talks about pericarditis, it typically gets classified into either infectious pericarditis, obviously meaning that it was caused by some pathogen, or non-infectious pericarditis. And then that terminology can be further subdivided into acute versus chronic pericarditis in terms of timeline. Most people, when they say chronic pericarditis, are talking about three or more months of pericarditis. And then once chronic pericarditis is established, that is then subdivided into either constrictive pericarditis or what's known as effusive constrictive pericarditis. And that latter term, the effusive constrictive, as the name implies, that would mean that there is the presence of an effusion. So don't get confused with the terminology. On your exam, they're going to give you pericarditis, and you're not really going to have to parse out are we dealing with acute versus chronic necessarily, but you should be aware that there is a spectrum of a timeline on which pericarditis can occur, and depending on where you are in that timeline, you get a little bit of a different presentation. So let's take a look at that pericardium. Again, you see your two layers here, the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium, and a lot. this will make a lot more sense in a few minutes, but because that potential space between them has a very limited capacity to absorb more fluid or more mass effect, that is the reason that with inflammation in this area, you have reduced heart function and clinical symptomatology. So let's look at our etiologies. I told you that most people will classify this as infectious versus non-infectious. And to be clear, when I say that, I'm referring just to etiology. So let's take a look on the left-hand side of this screen. Infectious causes of acute pericarditis will tend to be things like Coxsackie virus B, parvo B19, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, and histoplasma. And then on the right-hand side of this chart shown in blue, your non-infectious etiology could be things like metastasis, it could be due to radiation, it could be due to connective tissue diseases, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, I didn't write it on the chart, but scleroderma can do it as well. It can be due to trauma, it can be due to uremia, it can be due to a post-infarction. So recall that following a myocardial infarction, you can have either post-infarction pericarditis, which tends to be fibrinous, occurring somewhere in the timeline of one to three days. And then you, we can also have um, a more long-term post-infarction pericarditis with something called Dressler syndrome. So if you've been studying, you might recall that Dressler syndrome occurs weeks after a myocardial infarction but that also manifests as pericarditis. And then lastly, it can be drug-induced. So the takeaway here is that lots of different potential etiologies of pericarditis, and this chart is the reason why when you're taking USMLE or Comlex, this is such a high-yield topic because the test writer could obviously, as you see here, start you off with a question about a patient who's either experiencing one of these infectious pathogens on the left. So the question's going to start with, you know, buzzwords that have to do with one of these pathogens. Or maybe they give you somebody who has acute or chronic renal failure, give you labs to suggest uremia, and now all of a sudden they're transitioning into a question about pericarditis. So these are third and fourth order questions that are really, really challenging. So you want to train your brain and establish those connections between these presentations and 
these elements of somebody's medical history and the potential to maybe develop pericarditis as a complication. So now let's look at clinical features. So this is really going to be probably the easiest part of understanding pericarditis. It's a pretty classic presentation. So the patients are going to have pleuritic positional chest pain. And I've always memorized this by pericarditis begins with P and the symptoms begin with P. So pericarditis is pleuritic, pericarditis is positional. And when I say pleuritic and positional, what I'm, I color coded it for you, pleuritic meaning it worsens with deep inspiration and positional meaning that that pain is actually relieved if the patient sits up and leans forward. And so when you're taking your exam, you want to always be comparing non-ischemic chest pain to ischemic chest pain. And so in this case, if you look at pleuritic and positional in pericarditis and you compare that to something like ischemic chest pain, I would point out that ischemic chest pain tends to be non-pleuritic, non-positional, and non-reproducible. And if you keep these clinical symptoms in mind, if you get a question and they give you certain findings, you can rule in or rule out different elements on your differential if you simply understand the pleuritic and positional nature of pericarditis and the chest discomfort that comes with it. Additionally, the pain may radiate to the trapezius, and that is because the phrenic nerve can become inflamed. That's a little bit of a, of a side point, but I have seen that show up. So just understand that in pericarditis, if the phrenic nerve is involved, then that pain can be um, radiated or referred to the trapezius. Now, something very, very classic of pericarditis is a pericardial friction rub, and this is pretty much pathognomonic for, for pericarditis. So this is a high-pitched triphasic scratching sound and what it what it what it's representing is the friction between those two layers of the pericardium so i showed you that image with the parietal layer and the visceral layer and pretty much when the inflammation occurs and that that potential space is compromised those layers will experience some degree of friction and that friction comes out and is audible as a pericardial friction rub now this is going to be best, best auscultated on the left sternal border while the patient is leaning forward. And I include that because on your exam, if you get the little 3D patient that you have to like put them in a certain position and click where you want the stethoscope to go, you want it to be on the left sternal border while they're leaning forward. Other symptoms could include fever, which is typically low grade, a dyspnea, non-productive cough, and tachypnea. So some non-specific, more generalized features, but these will be baked into the vignette. But the big thing here, obviously, pleuritic and positional and the pericardial friction rub. If you see those things, stop, do not pass go, select pericarditis. Now the test writer might give you an EKG, or I should say ECG. Uh, what that might demonstrate is widespread ST segment elevation, and or PR segment depression. Now they're not always going to give you the, the electrocardiogram. Um, it is a buzzy word that historically is associated with pericarditis, but because people read that and immediately jump to pericarditis, if I was the test writer and I wanted to be a real jerk, I wouldn't give this to you. So just keep in mind that this could show up, but it, it, it probably won't if I had to guess. So let me pause for a moment because I don't want you to get confused about where we're going in the lecture. So thus far, we've talked about pericarditis. I started with a little bit of terminology, explaining etiologies, and for the most part, with the exception of a few of those non-infectious etiologies, most of those etiologies cause acute pericarditis, which is to say that you experience pericarditis without an effusion for less than three months. Now we're going to talk about as the pericarditis becomes more chronic and goes for three plus months, what happens when that inflammation progresses longer term. So now let's transition into constrictive pericarditis. So when the term constrictive pericarditis is used, it refers to the loss of pericardial elasticity because over time, granulation tissue is starting to form over the pericardium. And so what this generally implies is that the patient had some acute pericarditis, and as a result of that acute inflammation, in the attempt to heal itself, there has been the formation of granulation tissue. The problem, of course, being that as that granulation tissue forms, as a semi-normal byproduct of 
of the inflammatory cycle that the body uses to self-regulate, now you have reduced pericardial elasticity. Now, if you have what I just said, plus the presence of a pericardial effusion, that would be considered effusive constrictive pericarditis. So I want to be very clear. Constrictive pericarditis, the heart has tried to heal itself from acute pericarditis. In doing so, the granulation tissue that is forming is reducing pericardial elasticity. If you have granulation tissue reducing pericardial elasticity plus a pericardial effusion, that is technically constrictive pericarditis, but it is a subtype known as effusive constrictive pericarditis. So don't get confused. Again, what we're looking at here, what we're talking about is that in that potential space between the parietal and visceral layers of the pericardium, if there's fluid in that space, then as that fluid accumulates, you get a pericardial effusion. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a pericardial effusion, and then we'll jump back into more generalized constrictive pericarditis. But again, don't get the terms confused. Pericardial effusion generally occurs alongside constrictive pericarditis in a chronic pericarditis. So when a test writer is going after pericardial effusion, what symptoms will you see? Well, a lot of the symptoms will look semi-similar to other presentations, so it's going to sound vague at first. You'll have retrosternal chest discomfort. There'll be compressive symptoms because, again, there's fluid in that potential space. So dysphagia, hoarseness, hiccups, the patient is going to have these compressive symptoms due to loss of that space and a mass effect on the surrounding anatomy. And you'll see orthopnea, of course. Now, what findings will you expect? This is what's going to kind of push you to pick the pericardial effusion. So there's a couple of things that I want to point out. One, you find the EWART sign, which is dullness to percussion with bronchial breath sounds below the left scapula. On an echo, you would see an anechoic pericardial space. Again, and that, that should make sense to you because you're, you're um, filling that area with fluid and therefore it's going to be anechoic. On chest x-ray, you could see three different things. You could, you'll see an, an enlarged cardiac silhouette. You might see something called the water bottle sign, and you might see something called the fat pad sign. And I'll show you some pictures in just a moment. And then lastly, you'll see hemo, hemodynamic instability, which should make a little bit of sense to you because the pericardial effusion is compressing the cardiac chambers. And when it becomes really severe, it's considered a cardiac tamponade. So as you can see, the terms kind of evolve here depending on severity. You get, you get chronic pericarditis, which becomes constrictive pericarditis. If there's an effusion, it becomes effusive constrictive pericarditis. And if the effusion tamps down on the cardiac chambers, then you're dealing with cardiac tamponade. So I'm just trying to use those terms so you can see the progression of the severity of what's happening pathologically. Now let's look at some of these images that I talked about. So enlarged cardiac silhouette, look at this image and compare this to a normal chest x-ray and please appreciate that the cardiac silhouette as the name implies is it's just bigger it's enlarged this is what they call the water bottle sign to be honest i don't see a water bottle when i look at this but if it has this kind of protuberant rounding of the edges and it's enlarged it's considered a water bottle sign don't ask me who sees a water bottle when they look at this but you know radiologists are um, very imaginative so now let's get back to constrictive pericarditis. Again, I took a little bit of an aside, talked about pericardial effusions that would technically be considered effusive constrictive. Now let's just talk about constrictive in general. So if you're dealing with constrictive pericarditis in general, again, it's usually due to somebody had acute pericarditis, that inflammation has now become more chronic, it's been lasting for weeks to months, and as that inflammation has progressed, as the heart has tried, as the pericardium has tried to heal itself with granulation tissue, you've lost a lot of elasticity, and now things are becoming more constrictive. So your symptoms here, decreased cardiac output. You'll see things like tachycardia, fatigue, and dyspnea on exertion. You'll see evidence of fluid overload, so jugular venous distension, um, increased jugular venous pressure, hepatomegaly, hepatojugular reflux, peripheral edema, anasarca, ascites. So at this point, because you have those constrictive features, you're starting to have compromised 
function of various elements of the heart, you see decreased cardiac output and fluid overload. And I would note that you don't tend to see these symptoms or, or certainly not to this extent if you're just dealing with an acute pericarditis where there's no constriction happening. Now, the findings in constrictive pericarditis are really high yield, and these show up a lot on exams, so I really want you to understand both Kussmaul sign and pulsus paradoxus. Let's start with Kussmaul sign. And to be clear, Kussmaul sign doesn't just occur in constrictive pericarditis. You might also see this in things like tricuspid valve stenosis, um, right ventricle infarcts, and certain restrictive cardiomyopathies. But because it shows up in constrictive pericarditis as well, you obviously need to know this. So what happens in Kussmaul sign is that when somebody takes a deep breath in, their JVD or their JVP, you could even say, does not decrease. And that is atypical. So normally, there is a decrease in intrathoracic pressure when somebody takes a big breath in. And so when somebody takes a big breath in, what typically happens is that the right ventricle expands and jugular venous pressure decreases. However, in constrictive pericarditis, because the right ventricle has decreased compliance because of the inflammatory changes that are happening, the right ventricle is unable to expand when somebody takes a deep breath in. And so in constrictive pericarditis, when somebody takes a deep breath in, that pressure and that distension does not decrease. In fact, it can actually increase, which is very, very atypical. So if you see that, that could suggest that the patient has constrictive pericarditis. It's also possible that the patient's dealing with one of the other issues that I mentioned a few moments ago. Now, pulsus paradoxus, um, kind of similar concept in that there are certain things you see when a patient takes a deep breath in, but, but completely different. So pulsus paradoxus refers to a decrease in blood pressure amplitude, um, and it, it tends to be 10 millimeters Hg or more during deep inspiration. And so let's break down the, the pathophysiology here. So when somebody takes a deep breath in, there is a drop in intrathoracic pressure that increases right ventricular filling. Now, because of the decreased pericardial compliance, this increased right ventricular filling places radial traction on the pulmonary vasculature. And then what ends up happening is on the left side, you have a decrease in left ventricular ejection volume. So if you're measuring somebody's blood pressure during deep inspiration, what you'll note is that there's actually a drop of at least 10 millimeters Hg when they take a deep breath in. So Kussmaul sign, pulses paradoxus, these two findings are seen in constrictive pericarditis and you wanna be on the lookout for this on your exam. So let's close by talking about treatment. To be clear, acute pericarditis tends to be self-limited, so you're not always gonna to jump to treatment, but if the question wants you to select an actual pharmacotherapy for this, then you need to know what to pick. So the answer is going to be NSAIDs, and that tends to be things like aspirin, indomethacin, ibuprofen, plus or minus colchicine. Now, there are certain situations in which you would add in or not use certain medications. So in the case of a uremic pericarditis or a connective tissue disease pericarditis, you would add in glucocorticoids. And if the pericarditis was post-infarct, we talked about that at the beginning of the video, but if it was a post-infarction pericarditis, you would avoid any non-aspirin NSAID. Okay, so a little a little finicky here, a little nuanced. If you're guessing, if you don't want to waste time on this, just NSAIDs plus colchicine, you can memorize that um, with the carve outs, of course, being uremic and connective tissue disease pericarditis and post-infarction pericarditis. So I hope that this wasn't too complex. I, I hope that I was able to break down acute versus chronic versus constrictive versus effusive constrictive versus effusions versus tamponade. The terms, they all kind of exist on a spectrum, but they all refer to very different things happening in the heart. But all of this boils down to the, the parietal and the visceral layers cannot expand, cannot increase their compliance, that, that space between them is limited, and you get symptoms. That's pericarditis.